I'll start. I'll try to keep it short because we have a lot to go through. I am uh, Murdad. I'm the head of the Application Management and Marketing Division at Infineon IPC ISD. And Martin, to you. So I'm Martin. I'm uh, working as a system architect in Meridot's team. All right, let's get started. Um, a short overview of the webinar, and I welcome you all to this. We'll start with a very short introduction, uh, then focus really today on the big power blocks in the heat pump, namely the PFC block. Uh, we'll talk about the leading edge technologies that Infineon offers, so our advanced technologies for this application and, and how they uh, drive design degrees of freedom. Uh, we'll then go into the next big power block, the, the drive, the compressor drive, then summarize the design degrees of freedom, and then have our final thoughts on this. So with this having said, let's start with the introduction. Heat pump, energy, that's a big topic. We all know we are at an energy scarce time due to various global um, situations. And it is clear that not only energy is a scarce and important resource, the effects of utilizing energy is another thing that is driving our future as and our planet, namely the emissions that are caused by the utilization of energy. And it is clear from this um, market picture that heat pumps are an essential changer for this future. And without dwelling too long over this, we are focusing today really on the power level of the residential area. And with that said, I want to jump already into the first big power block, the PFC. So we're looking at a simplified block diagram of the outdoor unit of a heat pump. And uh, here we see two, the, two uh, conceptualizations of this. Martin, you want to take it? So for different power levels, uh, we're looking at a single phase or three phase solution. On the left, you see the single phase solution uh, with a, a single phase PFC connected to this, uh, the motor uh, for the compressor, outer unit fan auxiliary supply. On the right side, um, I will come to this later, is this three phase uh, system. So we start with a, a single phase PFC and um, for the power levels we're looking at, we can't uh, use a passive uh, PFC here, but we're looking at boost and totem pole in detail now. So the simplest um, implementation of a PS PFC uh, is the um, CCM boost topology. We are using a bridge rectifier on the input and following this uh, we will have an inductor and a unidirectional switch and diode. It's very simple to control, it's very simply, uh, simple to implement. Due to the bridge rectifier, uh, we are always uh, only having moderate efficiency. Um, given the voltage classes we are looking at, input voltage of 230 volt RMS, um, we will run into an output voltage of DC 400 volt here. There's always an option to uh, do interleaving, uh, meaning duplicating uh, inductor, diode and switch um, to decrease um, the losses in the system and to reduce the ripple on the uh, input signal. So looking at that topology, I think it comes to my mind, we've got some very good choices for this and, and we'll go into the technologies later, but it's simple enough, it's cost effective, but the efficiency and the power factor correction are probably will benefit from a silicon carbide uh, diode uh, in this topology. And for the switch, we really have a large breadth of portfolio, which comes into our thought of this degrees of freedom, namely IGBT superjunctions or, or SIG MOSFETs. So let's look at the next topology. This is talked a lot uh, recently, uh, totem pole. You want to tell us a little bit about what's so exciting about totem pole? Well, totem pole is basically uh, you're removing the bridge rectifier and replacing a one leg of the bridge rectifier by active switches. Those need to be bidirectional now because uh, we have to conduct both uh, phases of the AC input uh, current. But by removing the um, bridge rectifier, uh, we are having a lower part count uh, for the overall system. Uh, we are increasing the power density by this. and um, Actually, we have a higher efficiency with this uh, topology than with the boost PFC. So, uh, one of the things one always hears in connect connection with the uh, totem pole is to go towards uh, you know higher switching devices. Here, I have classically starting with IGBT plus SIG diode. Those are not really the high switching devices, but silicon carbide MOSFET. You often hear GAN with this, right? Um, what are what are the system type of benefits that you see with the totem pole now? 
as a, as a PFC stage? Well, we need to have uh, fast switching devices uh, for the active switches anyways. Once we have fast switching devices, we can switch them fast. By this, removing the um, constraints for the inductor size. We can shrink the inductor, removing some of the conduction losses there by uh, going to fast switching. So, I mean, if I look at that big box standing outside my door, I think reducing the inductor is, is maybe a, a nice thing, but it's not really space constrained. But is it right to think that, well, I am improving my efficiency, I'm improving my power factor correction with the totem pole, I am go to higher switching frequencies, I'm reducing footprint, which is really integration density. I'm minimizing my PCB. I have, with a design degree of freedom, I have a thermal design degree of freedom with these faster switching devices at lower losses. So I can, I can play with my heat sinks and so on. So my overall system costs go down. So your, your main benefit is that you're increasing the efficiency and a side effect is that you're needing need uh, less parts and have a higher density as well. All right. Let's look at those technologies later. Uh, let's move into the three-phase story. So looking at the three-phase PFC, um, we have the options of going passive um, for uh, a certain uh, power level or going to active. And for the active rectification, uh, we are looking at the Vienna rectifier. So I understand the simplest form and the cheapest form is to go passive. Yeah, that is indeed uh, the case. As you can see on the picture, you only need six diodes and uh, three inductors. There's also a, a possibility to go with a single inductor uh, to make a basic PFC. But as you can see on the lower part, the power factor that you can uh, get is never ideal um, to what you're actually targeting for. So you're limited in power what you can get out of this um, uh, design. So I'm really not really using the power I would have available at my mains because my power factor correction is not, not okay. And then another thing comes to mind, when you're moving from region to region, right, you can't make a one-fits-all solution, right? Because if I'm in the mains in the US or Asia or Europe, there would be different requirements on, on designing this to a certain extent. In this very case, um, as we're just rectifying the AC input, um, we will have a dependency on the DC bus voltage um, of our input uh, voltage. So for our European uh, 230 volt uh, mains, we are running uh, at a rectified uh, voltage of roughly 600 volt, um, but we don't have control over this. It's not uh, stabilized um, for surges or other regions. So you're really motivating us to go towards active rectification, right? And here you chose the Vienna rectifier topology. Um, it's kind of overwhelming on first sight, but I think you have you you, you have an explanation to this. Yeah, there are, there are various uh, topologies what you can do for a three-phase um, uh, PFC, but one of the most popular designs uh, that has been um, uh, on the market since the 90s is the Vienna rectifier. Just because of the easy implementation, uh, which you can see on the lower left uh, in brackets B, um, it consists of six diodes and one single uh, active switch which has proven to be very cost effective, very efficient, has a very high energy density, and uh, in the end uh, we can have a nearly ideal power factor with um, very, very good uh, electrical performance. What I do understand though, and, and you have it noted out here, is when I go towards active power rectification on the three phase, I will need, uh, particularly on my drive side, higher voltage devices, right? That is true. Um, once we um, use an active uh, PFC, we'll, we'll boost the voltage. So instead of having the 600 volt uh, like before, we're now facing 700 or 800 volt. Interestingly, in the Vienna uh, topology, the active or uh, the, the semiconductor switches do not see the full voltage span. So uh, the devices can have a lower voltage rate. Okay. Okay. So again, here I'll see some exciting choices. I think uh, here the, cumul the cumulating diodes uh, would benefit from being a silicon carbide diode. And I think again, for the active switch, we have a large breadth of choices uh, playing into our freedom, design degrees of freedom, which we'll talk about later. And I think that's kind of a good point to come to our next chapter, right? Namely, uh, the leading edge technologies that Infineon has to offer, not only for PFCs, I'll kind of cover the drives because I know you come to the drives too. This is very much similar technology platforms. Now, Infineon is the leader in you know, silicon technologies. And I think just by the sheer breadth of IGBT, part, the portfolio of IGBTs that we have, it becomes uh, quickly clear. One of, one of the premier new releases in our IGBT family is the S7, 
where you know uh, not only were our technologists able to you know, further shrink the device um, by uh, improving the, the trench technology, uh, but we have maintained short circuit with stand time, which might be interesting for certain drives applications. Although I would debate if we really need it in a heat pump or not, but uh, we have the option. And you can see that Infineon always far outperforms uh, competitors. And even inside uh, Infineon, we love that you know, offering a large choice because your system is not one uh, size fits it all to all these different parameters, the topologies you mentioned. You might want to operate at different frequencies, different load points, and so on, even for the IGBTs uh, and also for the drive. Uh, if we're looking at 1200 volt, we have a large breadth of uh, a family uh, of devices from the S7, the newest, down to the T2, the, the oldest. Um, and, and they all have their unique trade-off curves between short circuit with stand time, um, total uh, losses, depending on the DVD-Ts. You always have a very good controllability in DVD-Ts uh, on, on the uh, IGBTs, and then the resulting uh, VC sat and short circuit trade-off time. So for instance, if you want something that's geared towards switching, you can go towards the S, uh, S6, while the S7, the new generation, is is a, a more balanced device between short circuit, VC sat, and, and trade-offs. Also the 650 volt, right? You, we talked about the, the topologies before, the, the PFC topologies, the boost topologies. Uh, we have the 650 volt uh, trench uh, technology, the T7, as sort of a relative to the, to the seventh generation 1200 volt. Uh, here, again, we see best in class um, uh, performance uh, here in a, in a uh, PFC topology. Of course, the T, T7, is very much geared towards uh, drives, but uh, you can also uh, utilize it in the PFC. You can see still 98.7% efficiency despite short circuit rating. And if you really want to go and max it out with an IGBT, you have the uh, Trench uh, Stop 5 family um, for the PFCs and as said, the T7 for the drives in the 650 volt range. And, and, you know, we also have to mention on this page the superjunction technology, a very popular technology for the boost CCM to, uh, technology. Mix it with the silicon carbide diode. Again, best-in-class silicon carbide diode. And, and we really have best-in-class performance. Again, you can see by a large margin the RDS on capabilities in the packages and the, the efficiencies here. But that's kind of the past, right? We want to look into the future, right? And the future um, is why band gap. And, and I think... You, you showed us with a PFC already uh, some inspiration on, on why wide band gap is interesting. I think with the drives, you're going to show us additional inspirations, which might be not uh, necessarily intuitive. But let me first cover the technology. Um, Infinite is leader in silicon technology. And this means we want to be leader in wide band gap too. And hence, we've developed technology that not only outperforms competitors, it is also outbests them in, in quality and reliability. And for this, we've built a portfolio that sort of mirrors our excellence in silicon into wide band gap by having silicon carbide MOSFETs uh, in various voltage classes, GAN hemps in various voltage classes, and the appropriate driving and packaging technology around them. Uh, I shortly want to go into our technology. Why? I mean, there are some 12 watt uh, suppliers of silicon carbide MOSFETs uh, out there, but there are literally only two trench MOSFETs on the market, one of them being Infineon, and namely being the leader in that. 25 years of, of knowledge around trench um, in, in silicon is propagated into silicon carbide, developing one of the most reliable and uh, uh, performantly sophisticated uh, trench MOSFETs, giving quite a bit of advantages over a planar technology. What are these advantages? Um, let's look at a more detailed picture. A planar technology has a different uh, channel mobility. It's, uh, you, you have uh, a planar oxide. That's, that's what we're talking about when we talk planar technology. The current flow is still vertical in both devices. But in order to get better mobility, you need a high electric field here. In order um, to get that, you need to make the oxide thinner, hence reducing your reliability, which is not the case in Infineon's trench technology. You do not need to sacrifice oxide reliability for channel mobility. At the same time, 
Um, you have things like a threshold voltage that is similar and temperature stable like an IGBT versus the planar technology where you really reduce your uh, threshold voltage down to about 1.8 volts at, at higher temperatures. And due to the integration benefits of the trench, you're able to go to uh, a very high current densities, which is your area per uh, current that you need. And at the same time, due to the geometry that I showed before, you get uh, an excellent design body diode and switching characteristics, which I quickly want to touch up here. You have one of the few devices that does not require negative voltage in order to um, prevent parasitic turn on. It's something that you want to have in your PFC topologies where you might have very fast switching. Um, also, if, as a design degree of freedom, if you have some parasitics in your design, you really want to be immune towards uh, uh, inductive return on and these things. This is a robust device. This is the capacitive structure to give you that. Body diode, right? If you want to do active rectification, and you said there are many different active rectification uh, scenarios, we just uh, showed uh, a few, um, you want to be able to use the body diode. And you can see one of the few SIG MOSFETs on, on the market with a robust body diode capable of going into uh, various overcurrent conditions, robust over temperature, robust over voltage. And, and a key factor of the trench, if you go out there and you compare it to a planar technology, you will see due to the planar design, you will have a different uh, uh, space charge for, for the body doubt. And, and uh, you know, it's contraintuitive. People think silicon carbide does not have a QRR. That is the Schottky diode, right? But a, a MOSFET has a PN uh, transition, so it does have a reverse recovery. But the special thing about the Infineon uh, silicon carbide uh, body diode, MOSFET body diode, is it is very stable over temperature. The QRR does not change a lot. The snappiness is extremely smooth, leading to reduced EMI, which our system architects love in their designs. And one thing I want to point out is when you're using a body diode in the rectification of a PFC, you have to be watching out for surge currents, right? When you switch on the system, you have uh, inrush currents that uh, are surges. And um, usually in boost PFCs, you even have a bypass diode just for the sake of uh, covering this inrush current. Yeah, and, and here you see, here you have a, a body diode that's tested to a certain extent for inrush currents. And if you can design your system to be within these inrush current uh, modes, this is something this body diode is tested for. And not only that, there there's barely any devices on the market that offer short circuit withstand time of the active cell. And the silicon carbide MOSFET, the 1200 volt, is actually a, a device that can do under the appropriate drive conditions at least uh, three microseconds. And uh, not only that, there's also advances in, in our packaging. And this is another design degree of freedom, right? It's a thermal design degree of freedom. And, and we have the .xt um, innovation in our packages, the diffusion soldering. I'm not going to go into depth here. But it gives you a better RTH beyond anything you have in the, in the market, right? And as this heat pumps hopefully we'll be covering large areas of this world, right? We have to start thinking about cosmic radiation. And here you see the cosmic radiation reliability of our SIG MOSFET is uh, considerably better than the IGBT and the diode, given the smaller area, right? Cosmic rays is something hitting our MOSFET, and the smaller the area, the better relative to the IGBT. And we don't have a diode, so we don't have a second failure case. And on top, if you compare this to a competitor, this is some of the best-in-class performance on reliability. So you really see our technology spans, and, and this is what kind of we want to show our customers, right? Our, our technology spans a, a large breadth from silicon to wide band gap. And I didn't even go into GAN here because we think GAN might be the next uh, uh, stage in these applications, but silicon carbide, superjunction, IGBT will do the job for now. Um, we really have the full portfolio, and we are leading edge at the silicon. We're leading edge at uh, the SIC, and it gives us enormous, interesting degrees of freedom. And, and with that, I want to go into the drives, right? Let's look at the block diagram of the drives. Uh, again, nothing new. Now we're just looking at these two, correct? I think uh, electrically, they are practically the same topology. Well, they are, but we're not looking at, at the uh, compressor drives uh, as a standalone application. We're looking at uh, the drives in combination with the motor. So um, whenever we have a system um, of a motor with uh, its driving part, 
we have different types of losses in the whole system. Yeah, and, and that's where we want to go and look at the full picture. There we go. So when we are looking at uh, a motor system, then the converter losses are only one part of this. It's not the full uh, truth. The full truth uh, of the motor system is that you have transmission loss, mechanical losses, which the electronics cannot uh, do th uh, too much about it. But one of the significant parts inside the motor losses are the core losses, contributing um, iron losses and permanent magnet losses. Those can be uh, altered with uh, the electronics. Conduction losses in the motor uh, is also part of the losses, but usually insignificant. And then there's our converter losses. All right, let's look at these system losses and how uh, the semiconductor uh, influences these uh, sort of magnetic and mechanical parts of the system. So let's look at what is considered uh, the majority of the losses inside the motor system. It's the iron and uh, permanent magnet losses. How do they uh, come about? Uh, whenever we have um, a polarization change in a magnetic uh, system, we will have um, hysteresis in the magnetic materials. And by changing um, the magnetization, we will also have eddy currents adding to losses. Um, this happens with the ripple of the uh, input signal and also with uh, harmonics and other distortions on the sine wave that are additionally to the useful uh, sine wave frequency. So in principle, what you're saying is, if I have a switch and a control loop that gives me a better sine signal, uh, I'm directly influencing losses in my motor, something that uh, usually people don't think about. That is true. Um, we cannot change. Uh, we cannot uh, mitigate all the losses, but we can mitigate all the losses that are unnecessary, which comes and in addition to an ideal sine wave. We can approximate this. Okay. So besides my obvious losses, where sort of the converter technology comes into play, we are now extrapolating the switch into the into a picture. But let's still look at the converter losses just to summarize. So in the system, the converter itself uh, also contributes greatly to the uh, overall efficiency. But what you can see uh, in this uh, picture here is a comparison between the efficiency of the whole motor system on the left in the, in the foreground and the inverter in the um, right lower part in the background. And you can see, without going into the depth here, that the, that the efficiency of the motor system reaches something like 95% in this example, while the inverter itself has 99%. So why would we actually uh, think about improving the inverter if it, is, if it has uh, such significant, insignificant uh, contribution to the overall losses? And this is um, where we want to uh, emphasize not only the primary effects of creating a better efficiency in the inverter, but also the contribution to the overall system efficiency. Excellent. So I'm getting a couple of percent point over having the best technology in my converter, but having the appropriate technology in my converter, I can influence some of the hidden losses that are part of my much bigger losses. Uh, I will call it physically wrong spectrum. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, which brings me to the next point. Uh, right. Now, signal integrity across my, my switch, right? How does my switch make its signal? And, and that has something to do with the switching waveform, and that's what we want to look at next. And how does that reflect back on what you just said? So usually if we are talking about motor systems, we are talking about uh, restrictions of DVDT. We hear things like 5 volt per nanosecond as um, uh, the rating for a motor. But as you can see on the right, um, these are two different curves um, simulated with a silicon carbide MOSFET in blue and um, a silicon IGBT in red. Both of these curves are following the same 5 volt per nanosecond 1090 signal. But as you can see, the shape of those curves is significantly different. The IGBT starts slow and accelerates uh, towards the end of its transition, uh, leading to uh, overshoots, leading to ringing, and leading to uh, higher frequency components in your EMI spectrum. Silicon carbide, on the uh, other hand, uh, due to uh, the smooth capacitive structure, will also have a smooth uh, transition when switching on and switching off, which leads to a improved uh, EMI, imp improved sine wave quality due to the predictive timings, uh, and also kind of uh, to lower losses. So we'll talk about the losses later, but let me just come back to this. I'm having the same DVDT here, and 
yet I'm improving the system. This is really a technological phenomenon, right? a, a property of a, a unipolar switch versus a bipolar switch, a property of my silicon carbide versus my IGPT. And, and here, I'm already at the same DVDT improving my systems EMI. I think in the next picture, we'll uh, maybe talk a little bit more about EMI. And uh, I'm still staying at my 5 volts per nanoseconds. We typically hear that 2.5 to 14 volts per nanosecond is sort of the range of a lot of motors. What I would like to challenge here also our listeners is if we're bringing that converter closer to the motor, we don't have these really long cables where these EMI requirements come from. If the bearing and the isolation, as particularly the isolation, allows for higher DVDTs, the nice things with the silicon carbide is we don't need to increase DVDT to get improvements, but we can if we want to, right? Silicon carbide is capable of uh, switching uh, way be beyond 30 volt per nanosecond. So let's continue looking at that turnoff curve. So we're looking at the very same curve uh, we saw before. Now with dotted lines, we also see the currents of the uh, signal. Uh, of the switches. And what you can see here is that the current of the IGBT, the red dotted line, is not dropping to zero, but it stays on for a longer time after the switch uh, event has occurred. This is the infamous tail current. This is very low in uh, Infineon's IGBT technologies, but it's still there. It's completely mitigated or omitted by silicon carbide MOSFETs. Looking at the turn on curve, uh, we now see uh, it has the same uh, shape um, of, uh, of the voltage signal in general. So the IGBT is also uh, starting s uh, fast now and going slower here. But what I would like to talk about uh, in more detail is the peak of the current. This current peak is uh, coming from the reverse recovery of the uh, commutating diode. And in silicon um, IGBTs, this is usually a silicon diode with ha which has a large uh, reverse recovery charge requiring the high uh, peak and the decay of this charge is rather slow. It also um, adds to the overall losses. Silicon carbide, on the other hand, still has QRR. It has a reverse recovery charge, but it's smaller and it's faster. And as I said before, and I showed quickly in the technology slides, Infineon's trench MOSFET has such a good behavior because snappiness is important for EMI, right? The way, the way this kind of goes back. And, and a, a body diode that's stable over temperature that has a good behavior is something desirable. And again, uh, brings in a, a, a new degree of freedom, which enables you to make a better design around your, around your system. Correct? True. All right. Now, now that we have sort of looked at the individual components, let's, let's, let's look at the total system losses, right? Uh, and, and see what happens uh, over frequency and over, over these conditions. So what we have done here is um, we simulated uh, a reverse conducting uh, RC2 technology IGBT with a 650 volt 260 milliohm uh, silicon carbide MOSFET. Um, the IGBT has the red curves and uh, silicon carbide the blue ones. If we design it to have similar uh, DVDT first of all, mm -hmm. secondly similar uh, conduction losses at 5 uh, amps RMS of a sine wave current, which corresponds to three, three and a half kilowatt of output power. Um, we can still see that the IGBT has significantly higher switching losses or overall losses due to the higher switching losses. And this is with eight kilohertz. On the right side, we can see if uh, we increase the switching frequency out of the audible spectrum into the 16 kilohertz and above uh, range, the significant switching losses will become even greater with the IGBT. The silicon carbide MOSFET, on the other hand, still maintains a low overall loss signature. So it's interesting. One of the key features in here is what you have also to say towards uh, uh, system designers is make the choice of your parts also uh, match to a certain extent. Just just don't take any SIG MOSFET or any IGBT. You can you can find you can find uh, related devices and nevertheless under the same DVDT conditions because of the properties you said before you're getting better losses and you're getting a better signal integrity meaning in your control loop you can do a, a, a better sine wave and I think that brings us to the summary slide on on this and and walk us through this so with um, making a better controller or the control electronics we can first of all um, increase the performance of the motion control. 
What does this mean? We can have a better loop precision. With a higher precision, we can control uh, the signal to have less distortions and harmonics on the fundamental signal. Um, we might even be able to increase the loop bandwidth to go to higher um, fundamental frequencies or a faster reaction of the system, which leads us to the system efficiency. If we reduce our distortions on the signal, we have reduced eddy and hysteresis uh, losses, and also uh, the same goes for the blind currents in the uh, copper losses. The same goes if we can increase the switching frequency. The eddy and hysteresis losses will be lower by this, uh, as well as the copper losses. And if we can uh, have an inverter that is more efficient, we have less losses on this part. And we can also uh, take this approach and go to the uh, motor itself. So once we have uh, the ability to go to a higher fundamental frequency, we can uh, choose a different um, motor design, higher pole count motors, for example. Um, we could also uh, think about uh, higher RPM motors with uh, the electronics. One of the significant uh, things that I just mentioned before is the EMI. With cleaner switching edges, we have less EMI, but also we don't have uh, so much common mode um, stress that would lead to uh, earth fault currents through the bearings, improving the lifetime of the motor. And with reducing our losses inside the motor, we might be able to open up some space for trade-offs and losses of the overall system going to different uh, sizes, sized motors, smaller motors, or actually trading off losses on one part and the other. So you're bringing me back to my uh, talk about design degrees of freedom, right? And here now you're nicely demonstrating how switch technology um, and even control uh, loop uh, technology and software, right? Uh, also, by the way, uh, a part where Infineon is, is very strong in, right? You do need the right controller to run the sinusoidal um, fidelity that you want to. Uh, so really using new technologies opens up design ways of making our green application even greener, right? And this kind of brings me into this additional degrees of freedom. Here, we're sort of discussing three. You have a technology. The technology is your one of the degrees of freedom leading to other uh, design choices, meaning you can improve an existing system. Those are sort of like your upper two points, if your controller allows. And even building a motor that is geared towards your technology. That would be the other way around, right? So you can choose which way you want to go, right? And that brings me to the final part, the design degrees of freedom to kind of summarize it. I'll, I'll start with the marketing slide, and you have to forgive me for that. Um, just a little bit on our products. But what I want to really visualize is the breadth. Again, a technology requires a right product, uh, a package, and a right package and a switch requires a driver, and a driver requires a microcontroller. And Infineon really comes with the full story. And with the technologies I said before, the, the breadth of IGBTs, silicon carbide, GAN, superjunctions, we really introduce degrees of freedom, including the packages, right? You can see here. For the sick diodes, we have different uh, voltage classes with different packages. And for the, uh, we even have hybrids where IGBT and sick diodes are together, either in discretes or in, in modules. Uh, or, or we have full sick um, offerings in discrete uh, in smart modules. We also have IGBTs, of course, in smart modules. We have a gate driver and, and, and an IGBT or a sick MOSFET. And again, the sick MOSFET modules. And then again, we have a breadth of drivers with various functionalities that bring degrees of freedom to your design. And how can we summarize that picture? We can summarize it in, in four sort of pillars, I, would, I like to call them, right? Technology, integration complexity, layout, and assembly. Technology we kind of extensively discussed now, right? We, we have PFC topologies that have their own operating conditions, their own benefits, and we are offering this breadth of leading edge technology, both silicon and silicon carbide, to accommodate it. But because we have this technology, right, um, the customers can look at their system and say, okay, I want to improve this, and I have a degree of freedom in technology. Now, next is integration complexity. One person likes to design discrete. We have discretes that go to a few millions with sick MOSFETs. At the same time, we have modules for even higher power density. We have smart modules with IPMs, with integrated drivers, to facilitate 
uh, integration, make it easier for people who might not be so adopted to integration. And our highest form of integration is when we have controllers, gate drivers, and power stage in the form of iMotion controllers, right? Power ranges will vary, but integration complexity, hence how the user does it. And that reflects on your layout. Your layout is your thermal design, your degrees of freedom that you have there, the choice and the parasitics that you get. Uh, the power density that you get. Again, I talked about the .xt technology. We have it in modules, we have it in discretes. That already gives the customer a new degree of freedom in terms of thermal design, or top side cool, bottom side cool, and so on. You can see the impact of parasitics. It's, it's clear, particularly if you go to high DVDTs, something you want to omit is parasitics, right? State-of-the-art modules uh, from Infineon and uh, packages consider these things. Or, Often customers talk about, you know, I have, a, I have one microcontroller that does, that does uh, motion control and PFC, but I don't know how to arrange things. Well, with, if you kind of have this little dummy drawing here of a PCB, you can, you can go for um, fully integrated solutions, compacting your design. So there's a lot of degrees of freedom. And last but not least is assembly. And assembly is a cost people kind of not necessarily often think about, but it, you know, press fit, soldering, uh, um, then, then sort of top-sided uh, packages, like uh, leadless packages and so on, they each give you a different degree of freedom in assembly. And, and that's what we really have. We have the technology, we have the packaging, and we have the know-how to support our customers integrating our technology in the system. And this is really what we're offering with design degrees of freedom. But an excellent semiconductor company also thinks about its supply chain, and that's what I want to sort of uh, finish up with our technical discussion. We have extended our capabilities in, in Filach, state-of-the-art fab, uh, white band gap, and silicon. We are extending Kulim to commit to white band gap and, and um, extend uh, facilities there, and we're really looking at the full supply chain. Infineon is diversifying on wafers. It's not just relying on, a, on, on making its own wafers or something like that. It's really trying to diversify, and by diversifying, uh, optimizing the way it, it uh, gets resources. At the same time, investing in technology that enables to optimally use the largest cost point of white band gap, the wafer, particularly in, in SIC, because GAN is on silicon. Uh, here we have propri proprietary technology, tongue twister, um, in the form of Celtectra, and as I said, the uh, manufacturing capabilities. And with that, I'll, I'll take the round to the final thoughts. Um, you know, we, we did focus today on a very particular point of the block and of the, of the building block of a heat pump, right? A heat pump is a much more complex system. It comes in different variations. Uh, 45 minutes is not enough to discuss everything. Infineon is really a semiconductor solution provider. We, we, are investing in technology to make the world a greener place uh, with heat pumps, solar, renewable energies, all the way into automotive, big wind parks, and so on. Um, and for all of these applications, we try to be an, a solution provider. It starts with um, having the right manufacturing chain, having the right knowledge uh, in the form of system architects, and the right product. So there's microcontrollers, sensors, and so on we did not even cover today. Um, uh, but they're there. Um, we want to support our, uh, our customers in deriving the best solutions, right? The design degree of freedom is uh, sort of the catchphrase of, of our presentation, I would say. It's really, the designs are different. Each cus one customer might opt for a passive PFC solution, one for Martin's Vienna, uh, one goes for Totem Pole, another one might go for a totally different actively um, uh, was called actively rectified. <laughs> uh, so um, we have, you know, we have these different uh, differences out there, and uh, our ability is to cater to these differences and to provide knowledge of the semiconductor to the system and work with the customers to provide best-in-class semiconductors, packaging, gate drivers, microcontrollers, and and work. Uh, with with uh, you um, to provide the best solution for a carbon neutral and, and greener future. And with that, um, I want to thank you all for, for listening in. Uh, I'll, I'll invite you to visit our homepage on heat pumps where there is more of the system. 
solution offering, I invite you to reach out to us. Uh, we are very excited over thinking uh, into how our technology, our, our system understanding can improve systems, can improve everything from your performance to maybe um, your designs. And um, yeah, with that, thank you very much for your attention and thanks for walking through this with me, Martin. Thank you, Mehrdat, and thank you all uh, for participating today. And I'm really looking forward to future interactions, uh, starting with uh, potential Good questions. questions. Right yes, now. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, gentlemen, for this very interesting webinar. And yeah, um, as you already mentioned, we still have some time for all your questions. And here's the first one. Would you see a benefit in using an active front-end PFC for a three-phase heat pump? This question uh, relates to the uh, PFC part, um, where I uh, presented the Vienna as uh, one of the uh, go-to solutions. Um, you can do this with an active uh, front end as well. Um, this would have the capabilities of going bi-directional. I don't see the need to do that uh, in a heat pump application because we're not um, uh, recovering energy from the system uh, to feedback, but it would be a viable, viable solution uh, depending on the application needs. Yeah. I have nothing to add to that. Thanks, guys. Next one. Do you have a representation with the energy losses versus time? This could lead to see the relative losses for the tail versus the main switch loss. Uh, the energy losses over time. Um, so, so does that mean uh, sort of the, the uh, cumulative losses, uh, how it adds up? I guess, I guess sort of like if there is an increase in in thermals um, or something like that. Uh, we don't have one representation here, but of course, when we simulate or when we measure, uh, you can you can set the the duration and see how the losses evolve and and the tail, of course, decays uh, to a certain extent when the, uh, the 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 bipolar charge is completely depleted, and then on the next cycle, it's there again, uh, and that might commutate heat, uh, if I've understood the, the question correctly. Um, uh, that's something we can discuss. And if somebody wants additional measurements or simulations, we're always open to provide them. OK, thank you. Next one. Do you see an issue with the reductive short circuit wisdom time in wideband cap devices? No, I honestly, again, um, short circuit withstand time requirements in, in industrial drives is a uh, historic uh, system requirement coming from these relatively long cables. Of course, you also have failure modes of the motor that can lead to short circuit withstand time, a uh, requirement of short circuit withstand time. That being said, our silicon carbide 1200 volt has three microseconds short circuit withstand time at 15 volts operating gate. Um, now, even in the automotive space, we're seeing the reduction of short circuit withstand time requirements for wide band gap down to one microsecond. Today, modern gate drivers, such as the ones, the ICE drivers that we offer, have DSAT functionality, and the control loops are fast enough to detect the short circuit failure and turn off in time. So for silicon carbide, I do not see a bottleneck with a short circuit withstand time. GAN has absolutely no short circuit withstand time. Um, there, you again have to design for it. If you design for it, um, you, can, you can live without it. Um, but in, in SIG, I really, given the gate drivers that Infineon offers, the controllers, the current sensing, I don't see a problem. Okay, what you see is that current source converter might be more suitable for a heat pump application compared to voltage source once due to the inherent 20 dB filtering at the motor terminals. So we didn't cover uh, new technologies like uh, current source inverter in this uh, presentation. Um, the technology behind this uh, is rather uh, intriguing. Um, we need bipolar uh, blocking switches um, for this to work uh, out perfectly fine. Um, the technology on, um, that, that we would have that could support this in a single device uh, would be gallium nitride. So this could be a future uh, technology um, where, or actually this would be a, a topology that in future uh, can drive um, the implementation of gallium nitride in these applications uh, and have really great benefits, like, for example, the dampened uh, yeah. or the better sine wave uh, quality. 
Yeah, definitely. You have uh, very exciting uh, um, topologies towards motors with, with this type of uh, topology. And uh, of course, Infineon being at the forefront of technological uh, evolutions, looking into these um, topologies and the technologies required for that. And as Martin said, our GAN technology is evolving in that direction to offer this feature, and it would be pretty unique on the market. Today, we're not there yet, but it is definitely something that is in our roadmap. Okay, next one. Do you have any application on T-Type Vienna with SIC? Do we have any application on uh, T-Type Vienna with SIC? Yeah, so, so does, that, does that mean, I guess it means, do we see any use for T-Type uh, applications, Vienna applications with silicon carbide? I guess that's the yes. question. Yeah. Seems like definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Vienna um, rectifier has the neutral point um, in the system anyway, so we can uh, also use it. And um, going to this um, would be a great benefit for the system. It's always a design choice if you also want to have um, the uh, suitable inverters uh, for this or uh, if you still uh, take the uh, two-level inverters as a given. Yeah, I think, I think with multi-level uh, inverters, um, generally... Uh, the complexity lies also a lot in the power control. Uh, so I think you're introducing an additional degree of freedom, uh, sorry, an additional degree of complexity in this case, not, not necessarily freedom, by, uh, by a more complex uh, control uh, algorithm maybe. Uh, but definitely uh, you can use it. And, and I would say also GAN would be even interesting for those multi-level uh, topologies. Yeah. Could you introduce a hybrid heat pump concept? Could we introduce a hybrid yes. heat pump concept? If one of our partners wants to work with us to develop a hybrid heat pump concept, we're definitely open to that. We're not heat pump manufacturers. Uh, I, I, I'm not quite certain what, um, uh, I mean, there, there are various heat pump, to air to air, air to water. I don't really know what a hybrid heat pump is supposed to be, but whoever is interested and has an idea uh, you know, we, we are always open to crazy new technology. Good answer. <laughs> okay, and next one. Do you think it's safe to increase DVDT on the motor? Well, yes. Um, con depending on... It depends. The, depends. the answer is it depends. Um, the levels that we uh, are juggling usually is 5 volt per nanosecond. That comes from long cables in industrial applications for the reflections on the uh, terminals on the motor. In heat pumps, we don't have long cables, we don't have um, uh, reflections uh, that are going into the low frequency band that we are dealing with. So increasing the, uh, the DVDT um, for the terminal reflections is a safe story. We are limited or we might be limited by the insulation strength of the windings. And this um, is usually much stronger than 5 volt per nanosecond would allow. So we would expect, but this is uh, an expectation value, it's not uh, that we have backing uh, data for this internally, we would expect 20 to 30 volt per nanosecond being safe yeah. for the motors. I think what we can say with confidence is talking to motor experts. Today we do see a bandwidth of from, from 2, which is the very lowest, to about 15, 16 volts per nanosecond. So a double that 5 volts per nanosecond is still safe for most motors. And, and potentially you can drive this towards 20 to 30. As Martin said, we don't, have a, we don't necessarily have data for that, but we've had discussions and, and we believe that uh, a lot of these constraints on the motor uh, um, might be historic and not necessarily a system limitation unless there is really like cheap insulation or a cost down in sort of insulation material or something there. We'd have to be careful. Again, I think that's a, a, a range we would love to explore uh, with a partner. Thanks, gentlemen. This was the last question for today. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you'll join one of our next webinars. Have a great day. Take care and goodbye.